very much for coming. Thanks for inviting me. You probably noticed I'm like double the age of the other two <laughs> headliners. Um, I like to think of this section as being a bit sort of like buy one, get one free. Or something like that. Uh, so I'm going to do a few poems for you. Um, the first one I'm going to do is the first poem I ever did at a poetry slam. So although I am somewhat antiquated, do come in, that's fine. <laughs> Um, I've only actually been performing poetry properly for about eight months. And um, the first slam that I went to uh, in Reading, oh, I should explain that at, at the Reading slam I'm known as words, uh, because my name is Sarah Smith and I do things with mm. <laughs> uh, That's how creative we are. <laughs> so you really need to know that for the first poem. So, um, yeah, so the first time I did it, we have a challenge round. First round, they, they set a theme, and the thing that they set was you had to write a rap about things you find irritating. And I, I felt a bit awkward about that because actually, although I'm not the obvious target demographic, I do like rap a lot, and um, I really respect it, and I didn't want to, it to be inappropriate or disrespectful, um, and... Um, that was before Honey G. <laughs> so, yeah, let's not even go there. Um, so anyway, I wrote this. Um, it's in two voices. The second one is me. The first is a character I've made up called Felicity. And uh, I hope you like it. It's called, This is not a rap about irritating things. My name is Felicity, and this is not a rap. If I tried to make it otherwise, then it would turn out crap. But I am white and middle class, and mostly rap is black. Right about what you know, they say, but what do I know of rap? <sighs> Sorry, I should calm down. I've not felt tip-top since my hip-hop, and all I know of hip-hop is that it rhymes with flip-flop. I thought, I need a pit stop to make this shit stop, and then the hip-hop rap had crashed on my laptop. <laughs> so I tried to be Serena. <laughs> I don't mean Serena Williams, the excellent tennis player. I mean, I tried to be calm. So I tried to be Serena. Discussed it with my cleaner. She said, Felicity, your only rap is a pashmina. <laughs> <laughs> and the only other great rap I know is a crab, quinoa, and sun-dried tomato <laughs> rap with avocado, delivered <laughs> by avocado. <laughs> so I'm handing over to Wordsmith, yo. Oh, thanks. So what's an irritation apart from this situation? Poor punctuation, misinformation, nowhere left to sit when you were waiting at the station, pure frustration, deliberate obfuscation, a lack of parliamentary proportional representation, <laughs> People who are faking it, running and not making it, an ice cream cone with no flipping flick in it. Drivers, drivers who undertake, drivers who tailgate, drivers who brake late, drivers who don't indicate, mate. People who say scone instead of scone. People who put the cream and then the jam on. I'm sorry, that's just wrong. <laughs> Murder, she wrote, three men in a boat, a one coat paint that takes three coats. Posh men in red chinos, overpriced frappuccinos, people who pronounce jalapenos, jalapenos. <laughs> Uncaring pastors, unsticky plasters, and people who make dramas out of middle class disasters. Thank you. I'm quite old, and so the memory starts to go. Um, but what I lack in uh, memory, I make up for in material. There's so much things to write about. <laughs> a little bit old. Um, you'll be able to say, you know that elderly poetry sensation, Sarah Smith, I was at her first <laughs> So, I don't know about you, um, I had quite a difficult childhood, and um, it's only been relatively recently that I've had the courage to acknowledge that get some counselling, come to terms with it. And that's why I haven't performed um, up until now. Um, so maybe you did as well, I don't know. 
Um, you probably do remember being 14. Some of you that wasn't long ago. Um, I was just thinking, you know, if you could write something to your 14-year-old self, if you could give it some advice, give them some advice, what would you say? So um, this is my list, 14 notes to myself at 14 years old. One. I should say, I'm not patronising you, I'm talking to my 14 year old self. <laughs> One, you are completely normal. You don't feel like it, but you are. Two, your family is not completely normal. <laughs> it's not your fault or your responsibility. Move in with a friend, get away, get safe, get some help. You need to recover. You need to discover what it feels like to be looked after. You deserve it. Three. In 1995, there will be a company called Yahoo. Buy shares in it. <laughs> Four. Mistakes are fine. You learn from them. For example, you might wonder what will happen if you're cycling along and you put your foot in the spokes of your front wheel. That's a mistake. But it's fine. And as you're lying upside down in the road, still somehow sitting on your upside down bike, know this, you are going to fail your physics O level. <laughs> but that's fine, you're never going to need it. Five. In 2004, there will be a company called Google. I'm not making this shit up. My shares in that one as well. <laughs> Six. Enjoy having a fit young body and know that you are beautiful. Don't be intimidated by magazines and telly into thinking femininity is something only other women have. You are feminine enough, more than enough, and you can determine what that looks like. Seven, don't vote conservative. <laughs> I know you think Margaret Thatcher will make a difference because she's a woman, but you have no idea. Eight, people sometimes die. Treasure those you love while you have them. Let them treasure you. And be prepared to grieve because grief is part of love. You will survive it. Nine. There's going to be a film called Avatar. It costs one and a half million dollars a minute. There are 162 minutes. I wouldn't bother. <laughs> Ten. When friends are going... <laughs> Ten. When friends are going through hell, be there for them. You don't have to know what to say or how to mend it, just be there. 11. The most precious gift you'll ever find is your faith. Hold on to it. It will confuse, comfort, challenge and sustain you, but trust your soul. It knows the truth. And don't listen to anyone who claims to have it all sussed out. They invariably don't. 12. Don't get drunk on Cinzano Bianco, it will put you off it forever. <laughs> and don't try and hide the empty bottle in the oven. <laughs> 13. If a guy offers to carry something for you, open something for you, or fix something for you, let him. It doesn't make you weak, it makes you connected. And apparently they love that stuff. <laughs> 14. You have the right to be safe. I know you're always afraid and never trust anyone. That's how you survived this long. But one day you will be safe. Learn to relax and to trust it. But it will take you time. There's a far better life ahead for you. You're going to be fine. How old is she? Seven? Yeah. She comes with her mum, who hosts it. And she just, oh God, I've just got to tell you this. And she comes up and she does her back catalogue, and she? she goes, I wrote this when I was four. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I wrote this when I was 19. Um, it's a breakup poem. Everyone needs a teenage breakup poem, and this one's mine. It's quite short. Uh, it's called Driftwood. You're not another pebble on the beach another fish in the sea. Your white sand shifting, deep green glass, smooth blue pool. You're a smiley puffin, a bit of a shark, 
a whale of a time. You're the seventh wave, and the coral red hot sun sizzling as it slips in and snuffs out. You're the sea in my eyes, my empty inside, a senseless surprise, and gone with the tide, with the tide, with the tide. devastated when I wrote the poem, uh, the, the benefit of hindsight is that the story goes that he married one of my friends and it was a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think I kind of dodged a bullet. <laughs> um, this, this, is, this is my penultimate poem, <laughs> as my Laika would say. This is a good word, isn't it? Penultimate. Um, and I wrote this one very recently. Um, I know that I am not alone in um, finding relationships uh, difficult. Uh, a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of self-doubt and all of that. And um, so I wrote this poem about, about that. It's called Things We Don't Know. There are things about me you don't know. A scar on my calf from the buckle of a saddle. Another on my knuckle from a broken cup, the little bugger lurking in the washing up. I hate going first or last at buffets. I drink tea from a mug when I get up. You don't know that the carpet in my car needs replacing, or that my hazel eyes are flipping amazing. Their colour shifts from fawn to brown to green, but this is a phenomenon you haven't yet seen. You don't know. There are things about you I don't know. The small things that make you smile, your funniest joke, your nickname as a child, or what you wanted to become, or how you felt when that couldn't be. How will you cope with my fucked up family? How many socks do you have in your drawer? Do you whistle or yodel in the shower? Do you snore? How's your courage under fire, your ability to heal? Where do you get your taste in music? How does it make you feel? You have some hidden depths, I'll bet. I just don't know them yet. There are things about me I don't know. Can I have what other people have? Am I lovable like people say I am? I know why I hold back. The root of my reluctance is my history. So I wish I could predict the past that's yours. I want to keep my distance if, for instance, you abuse substances or people or storm out slamming doors. And then I pause. I wonder how would I feel about love if I wasn't always afraid. But I always am, of course. There are things about us we don't know. What would our relationship be like or become? Will it be wonderful or dreadful or just leave us both numb? And at the end, there will be an end. And at the end, which of us will have to let the other go? These are things about us that we just don't know. We don't know. I don't know. You say, hey, we'll take it slow, and you've only asked me out for coffee, so yeah, okay, whatever, go on, let's give it a go. Because the truth is, we don't know. Something beautiful might grow, and we will never, ever know if I start by saying no. Thank you. for the wedding of a very good friend of mine, Claire, who is here tonight, who was married seven weeks ago. However, in addition, frankly, I have got two friends and two family members in the audience who are engaged. We've got Adam and Emma, we've got James and Sarah, they're going to be engaged soon. Even more amazing than that, uh, I've got friends in the audience called Robin and Faye, and tonight is their 30th wedding anniversary. And I want all of you to know that this poem is not about you. It's not. It's not. Because uh, Claire asked me to write something based on 
a Bible passage um, that talks about love being patient and kind, uh, and it's a really beautiful piece of writing. And um, so no pressure there then. <laughs> and um, the thing is about that passage and about this poem that it is not about romantic love between two people in a stereotypical kind of a way. It's about love, the whole of love. And um, I really liked writing it, and I really enjoy it as a poem because um, I just believe myself that everybody is unconditionally loved, just as they are. And I find that it's hard to uh, take on board as the next person, but I do really believe that. I certainly believe it for with you. So that's, so that's a start. And so, although this is a wedding poem, it's for everybody in the room, regardless of your relationship status on Facebook or otherwise. Uh, uh, it's called Building Love. And thank you very much for being so lovely. When love is in development, the way you build is relevant. It's architecture you can bet is more than incidental. Build your love house wrong, and while that could be detrimental. Think of making love in terraces. Through walls as slim as fairies' wrists, as thin as leaves of lettuces, your neighbours, not intending this, become reluctant witnesses. With eaves like leaves from full trees dropping, they can hear you revving up and stumbling, <laughs> stalling, stopping. That's embarrassing. And you could start to start again, but would they mark you at a 10? That might be depressing. <laughs> but I'm digressing. Because from palaces to tenements, from fortresses to cottages, the message is the same, and it is love, nothing matches this. Not love like in rom-coms with actors and actresses, or questionable practices on other people's mattresses, but real love, nothing matters as much as this. You can't be semi or detached from this, real love is what attachment is, and that's not easy. We're not all used to being intimacy, and intimacy, well, it's awkward. You can long for it, yet not know what to do with it. Have a yearning, but little learning how to go through with it. After the fears of physicality, how to just relax and be, to rest. Let lazy limbs and bodies melt into a happy, sleepy heap for ages. This you learn in gentle stages. Because love is patient, love is kind. Keeps you calm and warm while you unwind. Gives you time. So you can stretch right out and elongate your spine one vertebra at a time. And then you'll find you can do more, go further than you did before. Because love is patient, love is kind. Doesn't memorize your failings, it's just not that way inclined. So you need not be defined by the things you leave behind. It treasures, it protects, it believes and it holds. Cares, it keeps going, it sets free and it unfolds. It hopes and it trusts, it is honest and it's true, and it doesn't need you to be anyone but you. When love is in development, the way you build is relevant. It's architecture you can bet is more than incidental. Build your love house wrong, and well, that could be detrimental. But you've laid a foundation down on rock, not sediment. You've poured yourselves a pediment, pressed your handprints in its wet cement. Now you're ready to build up with something practical, yet elegant, and now's your season. There's no known reason or legal impediment why you shouldn't find a love that binds you now with gentle kindness. It's a grand design, a divine assignment. When stars that start out separate, then shift. Into alignment. Thank you very much.